What do we want? Freedom! Freedom for Cuba! Taking it to the streets. We're here to represent our families and um, everyone who's still stuck in Cuba. Show of support and demands for U.S. action. Our community is boiling over. Libertad! Libertad! Caravan to the capital. We want to tell President Biden that we need help in Cuba. Cuba is a, uh, unfortunately, a failed state. This is becoming a pandemic of the unvaccinated. COVID crisis 2.0. Nearly every single case that we're seeing that we're hospitalizing are people who are unvaccinated. Recovery from the rubble is slowing. Yes, yeah, I'm a Champlain Tower. Something's going on here. you got to get us out of here. Tracing what caused the collapse underway. There's lots of information we have to get, and it requires access to the site. And right now, we can't get that access. The big stories of the week, all live this week in South Florida. Good morning. Glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putney. I'm Glenna Milberg. We begin with history in the making and South Florida could be a driving force. About this time one week ago, unprecedented protests against the Cuban government erupted in dozens of cities across Cuba and South Florida jumped in to seize the moment. From rallies and marches that shut down some major highways to demands that the Biden administration take action, the call for change in Cuba became the big headline in local news here. And among those seizing the moment, Miami-Dade's three Republican members of Congress, they are all Cuban-Americans, and taking the lead, Representative Maria Elvira Salazar. She represents Miami's 27th Congressional District. She was elected in 2020. Congresswoman Salazar with us right now live via is it Zoom or Skype. Good morning, Congresswoman. <laughs> yes. Good morning. Good to see you. Thank Good you very you much too. for having me. You know, we hear, I uh, want to start out really quick by a question so many people are asking, so many people who may not have the attachment or attention to Cuba over the decades that we have. Uh, besides from being a Congresswoman, you are a Cuban American. You were a journalist covering Cuba a long time. What is different now? What's different now is that for the first time in 62 years, the Cubans have the courage. You know, the Cubans have lost everything, their food, their families, their freedom, their liberties, and now they lost fear. And you have seen, you, you, you see the images, you're showing the footage. First time in 62 years, and they are saying no more. We want libertad. And, and that then, footage, well, we're, the footage that we're mm -hmm. showing is is internet and social media. Isn't that sort of the game changer? Absolutely. And that is why we are demanding, we're asking, we're besieging, we're begging the Biden administration, this Democratic administration to rise up to history and do what's right. Turn on the internet. And as you were saying, we conducted a press conference where Mike was present. It's very easy. The technology is out there. We need the political willingness. Yep. And this message, Glenna, is for the Cuban Democrats and for every Democrat who's watching me. The Democratic Party has a historical moment to redress the fault of Bay of Picks. Yep. Now is the time to pay back. Turn on the Internet. At least pronounce the president of the United States can go out to the world and say we're with the Cuban people. The international community could be with us. We want to not only turn on in Guantanamo, but in the uh, U.S. embassy. It's there. You know it is there. Why don't they do it? And that's All a right. very Con big question. Congresswoman, let me let me. Yes. I was there at your office on Thursday. Heard what you had to say, Governor DeSantis as well. And what we have learned subsequently is that reconnecting Cubans to the Internet isn't as simple as simply throwing a switch. Now, there may be an answer with high altitude balloons which carry a satellite receiver. They tried those in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, but they were expensive. They weren't always reliable. So what is your idea for reconnecting Cubans to the Internet? The idea is, like I said, if there is political willingness, Mike, you could do three things. Number one, the DOD did it in, uh, DOD has the technology. We did it in Iran. We did it in Africa. They did it in Puerto Rico after the hurricane. So the DOD has the technology. We are not talking about Netflix and perfect it easy for the people who are in Santiago to upload yeah. those videos. Number three, the United States Embassy in the heart of El Malecón. You can also sort of rack up a little bit the Wi-Fi. And at least the Cubans, this is all the message that we're sending. You yeah. know, perception is reality. If they yeah. have the but perception me, that they're know, being watched... 
I, I yes, beg sir. your pardon. The Cuban government, the company is called Itasca, and it controls all cell phone and internet service in Cuba. And if you put a signal out there, our Channel 10 engineers say uh, the Cuban government could simply stop it. So what's... Oh, and, it, and it's happened with Radio Marti. But as you know, you can always surpass the Etexa Chinese surveillance technology with what I am saying to you. I spoke with Raven. I have a call out for the governor of South Dakota, where she pro she has expressed to us that Raven can wreck up and can just speed up the process. And that balloon, that aerial balloon cap uh, capabilities can be in few weeks. So all I'm saying is that the Biden and I'm going to go back to President Biden and the message is for him. I spoke with Marco Rubio. I've spoken with all the Cuban-American delegations in Congress. And all we want is a meeting at the White House. So then the president, president of the United States, can go out there and say to the Cuban people, you are not alone. We are, we're coming to help you. In which way? We're going to do everything we can. We're calling out on the international community. We're going to ask the United Nations to go in into Cuba and study the systematic repression, just like they're inviting to come into the United States to study the, the, study the systematic racism. So there are many things, Mike, that we can do, but the White House is doing very little. Well, so that's why I'm me, saying to the Cuban Democrats, let me it's just time down. for you to call. Let, yeah, well, but you me, know, and then when they call the White House, the White House is not taking calls. Yeah, and you actually, the White House is not to, working. To be fair, <laughs> Congresswoman, this is a, absolutely, at least in South Florida, a bipartisan issue. And the president did come out yeah. and make a statement as well, uh, actually said, that the White House was looking into exactly what you were talking about. Very but, weak, Lena. Uh, Very okay, underst weak. I understand your perspective. Here, here's the question. So let, let's go back to the seismic change of the Obama administration that so many of the Cuban exile community here was dead set against, the little, the little openings that the Obama administration tried to do, totally reversed by the Trump administration, which largely has been kept in place by the now Biden administration. So we're, we're seeing signs in South Florida, military intervention. We're hearing people from various factions wanting to do various things. Really, it's the Cuban people who need to decide. But what has not been done in the past 20 years that you think should be done? Listen, you just said it, the Biden administration. That was the historical moment when the Castro brothers could have proven to the world that Obama was right. Obama gave everything in this change of nothing. And what did they do? They spit on him. They didn't open up. They allowed every single American company to go in. They didn't sign those contracts. They, meaning the Castro brothers. We would have been able to have an, a, a Chinese model. The economy in Cuba would have been able to flourish. But the Castro brothers said no to Obama. So what's happening now? What is the difference? That the Cuban people are, are grabbing their destiny by the neck. And we need to help them. And all I'm saying is let's show to the world what the Cuban people are willing to do on the streets of Havana. That's all right, it. So, so what you would, what would you like to see, among other things, is the United States, President Biden, you know, go to the U.N., make a speech or go to the OAS, <clears throat> make a speech calling for the repressive Cuban regime to back off, let the people go and, and be in the streets. Uh, I mean, what specifically, what intervention do you want? I think specifically is what we have been asking, not only myself, the representative of the city of Miami, but the Cuban-American delegation in Congress, starting with Mayor Diaz-Balart and Marco Rubio. We want to go to the White House, talk to the president, and see his willingness to help the Cuban people. There are many avenues. There are many scenarios to do that. One of them could be to call out on the United Nations, call out on the Cuban, uh, uh, the Cuban uh, regime, on Diaz-Canel. There are many ways. All I'm saying is that we need to to see the willingness. There are many political channels, back channels and front channels that could be used and are not being used. But the one that I do believe that sends the message loud and clear to the Cuban people on the street willing to risk their lives is that we are with you and we are going to let you upload those videos showing how you're being beaten and tortured. Beyond. There are 500 political prisoners right now that are, have disappeared. And the most important one, the guy who started the San Isidro movement, he is in Villa Maristas. You know what that is? That's a torture camp. Why does he have, why does a musician have to be in a torture camp just because he composed a little song saying Patria or Vida? Come on. 
Congresswoman, <laughs> uh, aside from just uh, on the record as a as a lawmaker, would you support any sort of military intervention if it came to a question like that? Listen, I'm going to support whatever the Biden administration is going to do. Let you see that that question comes up all the time, but I think that there are few steps before that because you know this is uncharted territory. This is, we do not know what's going to happen because we have never seen that people that are facing the most repressive revolution or or a, a, a revolution that took repression to scientific levels, and still those people said no more, no fear. What are we going to do? Leave them alone? So when you're telling me about intervention, I'm talking to you. There are many ways of intervening. And we haven't even not, we haven't seen not even one. The first one, receive us. Let us go to the White House and talk to the president in which way he can help us. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying the Cuban Democrats need to call, need to call the White House. But when you call the White House, they are not taking calls. All right, Congresswoman, we know you are on a busy schedule. Yes. Can you stick with us for Thank another you. six, seven minutes? I, I, I have to go, but I will be there. I will be there whenever you need me next. Thank you. I have to really have to really run. Fair enough. You know we had to ask just in case, but safe travels Thank to you, you and yeah. appreciate yeah. you being with Thank us. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for doing a good job. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Uh, up next, we're going to look at protests happening right here around South Florida. You've probably seen them all week long. And we are going to get a live report from downtown Miami in just a minute. Protests against the Cuban dictatorship are entering their second week and they're showing no signs of slowing down. From right here in South Florida to Washington, D.C. as well today, people are calling that same call for change in Cuba. Local 10's Trent Kelly is live in Miami this morning to talk more about this week one in the books. Trent. And what a week it was, Glenna and Michael. We saw so many protests taking place all over South Florida, most notably the very large gathering we saw out here just yesterday, right next to the iconic Freedom Tower, this building once called the Ellis Island of the South, now serving as a new inspiration of sorts for those still hoping to bring freedom to the struggling communist nation. What do we want? Freedom! Calls for freedom filling the air on Saturday as thousands of Cuban exiles packed the streets of downtown Miami to continue their push for change. Freedom for Cuba! When the boat would go up, all I saw was the sky. Joel Gandara was just four when he came from Cuba on a boat. A similar story for Rosa Iglesias, who left the island when she was 19. What my country needs is the same thing that I came here looking for, freedom. Her daughter now pushing for freedom along with her. My parents came from Cuba and they gave me a life here. They gave me freedom. They were some of the thousands who came out to the Freedom Tower, a landmark for Cubans seeking a better life. Saturday's massive rally marking the seventh straight day of protests in South Florida, with many calling on President Biden to take action. Large crowds also gathering in Hialeah, where many marched for several blocks. Freedom will outlast this communism. Some South Floridians even taking their message all the way to Washington, D.C. Making the 15-hour drive from Miami to the White House, urging the U.S. government to help. We're trying to tell Biden we are here in your front door on our knees begging you to help us to help our people. And Florida Senator Marco Rubio also commenting on the Senate floor yesterday, calling those uprisings in Cuba unprecedented. Uh, in the meantime, the protesters we spoke with tell us for now they have no plans of slowing down. In fact, we're hearing there is another rally scheduled to take place later this afternoon. That will be held over at Tropical Park in southwest Miami-Dade. For now, that is the very latest from downtown Miami. I'm Trent Kelly, Glenna and Michael, back to you. For sure, keeping the pressure on. Trent, thanks so much. One of the chief organizers of the local South Florida response to this uprising in Cuba has been Orlando Gutierrez Baronat. He is a longtime leader in the struggle for democracy in Cuba, and he heads the Cuban Democratic Directorate, that organization, a humanitarian organization. Orlando joins us now live, and it's great to have you, Orlando. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me on. 
Orlando, great to see you again. We spoke on Friday at Brigade 2506 where you were leading a major news conference and you said that you wanted to be very clear you complimented President Biden for expressing solidarity with the Cuban people, the people in the streets, but you said he needs to do more. What more does he need to do? I think in, in light that we've had a national uprising of the Cuban people for freedom. President Biden needs to build on what the Prime Minister of Canada, the President of Brazil, the President of Uruguay, Ecuador, the Secretary General of the OES, and several European countries have expressed the need for Cuban people to have freedom and democracy and an end to this regime. A coalition of the willing that can jointly, at an international level, push this regime to uh, hold internationally supervised free multi-party elections so that Cuban people can regain their freedom and their sovereignty. Okay, so the natural next question for all involved is, how do you force regime change? Uh, sanctions, military intervention, what do you see as the appropriate measure to force regime, regime change in Cuba? Having studied these regimes and having been involved for a lifetime in the struggle for the liberation of Cuba, I have to say that all the options have to be on the table. This includes uh, sanctions against the regime, um, ending their, or their access to, to Western credit, which is still there, uh, a call on the Cuban military to defend the people and, and turn on the regime, and also there have to be military options on the table. Uh, in the past, in, in Bosnia and Serbia and Libya, these options were used to prevent massacres and to empower civic protests. Yeah, uh, Orlando, uh, go back to the point you just made a minute ago about uh, assembling an assembly, a, a coalition of the willing to put pressure uh, on Diaz-Canel and Raul Castro and the government in uh, Havana. I mean, we all know that both Mexico, Argentina, several other major Latin American countries are supporting that government. And the United States on this topic of Cuba really doesn't have much leverage at the UN because the UN continuously for the last, what, four decades has voted, you know, that the US is wrong to impose the embargo. So what leverage do we have with those world leaders or at the UN? Well, the first leverage is the Cuban people. They're rising, they're continuous resistance. Uh, the level of repression this regime has unleashed, Diaz Canel's unequivocal call for killing on the streets of Cuba, his so-called uh, call to combat. And I think President Biden does have the international leadership to create a coalition specifically for democracy in Cuba. We have a rogue regime in Cuba, a regime that is supported by the worst actors in the international scene, Russia, North Korea, Iran, uh, China, which is putting uh, the, the regime's bills. If we don't aid the Cuban people in removing this regime, these rogue actors will further consolidate their control, not just of, of, of Cuba, but of the Western Hemisphere. Argentina and Mexico are wrong on Cuba. They are, they are speaking from an ideological bias that doesn't take into account the fact of what that regime is and what they're doing to the Cuban people. So because you have been at this for so long, you have a perspective that maybe the people who live there, the vast majority of which are of a generation or two, that do not know life under a different government or regime. So now you have these generations really taking control of events there because of social media, because of their network of international information that that country had not had before the last, what, five years, six years? So, so with that new perspective on this old entrenched problem, what changes? Well, what changes are several things. First of all, yes, social media plays a role. That's why the Congresswoman is correct in insisting that we facilitate internet. There are other types of communication we can also help uh, empower the Cuban people with. But I must say the Cuban people have continuously risen against this regime throughout different generations. What makes it different now is that it was simultaneous, it was in over 30 cities, and it is continuing. The regime in the past has been able to isolate uprising, uprisings and crush them. Now it is nationwide and there's a deep feeling of resistance against this, this regime. And that is very important. We must need to build on that in order to accomplish the liberation of Cuba. Yeah, uh, you know, Orlando, let me just say personally, I admire your dedication over the many years to this. And I remember 
the bunch of Castro thugs who came running out of, you know, that meeting, was it in Panama? And literally tried to beat you up, you fought back. I mean, it was quite a moment in the history of, you know, anti-Castro, uh, uh, you know, opposition in South Florida. So, you know, kudos to you for that. Uh, let me just ask you here, uh, politically, President Trump listened to Marco Rubio on Cuba. It appears that President Biden is listening to Robert Menendez. Has Robert Menendez got the right message for the president? I think um, Senator Menendez was active, was an advocate of Cuban freedom before he was a senator, before he was a congressman, before he was a mayor. He's a longstanding activist for freedom in Cuba and for democracy worldwide. He's very well informed about what's going on in Cuba. I think he's one of the significant influences in the president. I think the, I think the statements by the president are very good conceptually. He's saying substantive things. When he says it's a failed regime, it is a failed regime. It's about the it, it's it's about time a president said so. And because it is a failed regime, we have to help guarantee stability. Stability comes through freedom and democracy. People don't rise on the basis of what they know or don't know. They they rise because every human being knows deep inside that they're free, that they have rights. And this awareness is is a force that leads Cuba, that leads Cubans to resistance across their history. We're seeing unprecedented scale in protests in Cuba. As of Friday night, there were still protests taking place. So we asked that we need help. And the steps are, are very simple. Sanction the regime, coalition of the willing, facilitate communication and information. Let's bring democracy to Cuba through international supervised free elections. Orlando, you are in touch with your contacts in Cuba. What do they say? Do they agree with your suggestions? Yes. I mean, what I'm saying, I'm, I'm taking from Cuba. And I wanted to say also, it's very important to understand this. The main organizations of the Cuban exile community, we're all together on this. We're all, we all are stating the same points. You saw us together yesterday at the Freedom Tower. We've been together at different press conferences. We are unified because our people from the island, what they're telling, it, telling us is, we're going to continue the struggle. Please don't abandon us. There's no going back. We want an end to the regime. We want democracy. We want human rights and liberty. We're getting what we're saying from our people on the island. Um, Communication has been maintained every day, although it's been difficult, but we have a good daily awareness of what's going on at different points throughout Cuba. Yeah. Orlando Gutierrez Boronat, always good to speak with you. Congratulations on your work, and let's hope that, in fact, there is a breakthrough. Thanks very much, Thank Orlando. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. This week, an alarming spike in COVID cases has health officials on alert. So what is behind the contagion? We're going to take it to the front lines with a doctor from Mount Sinai in a minute. An alarming rise in the number of COVID cases makes this the worst week for new COVID-19 cases in Florida since early May. More than 45,000 new cases, according to Florida's Department of Health. The number of hospital admissions is the major metric that communities use to gauge severity. And that number is going up also astronomically. More than 3,600 people hospitalized across the state, nearly three times what it was just a month ago. Dr. Robert Goldser is the chief medical officer at My Mount Sinai Medical Center in Miami Beach. Dr. Goldser, good morning, good, morning. Or good afternoon, I should morning. say. Glad to have you come. So what what amounts for this, this resurgence of COVID-19? Is it the Delta variant? Well, thank you very much for having me on your show. And it's interesting that um, the, the two first segments are part of what uh, leads to the extra infections that we're seeing in the community. The infections are way up in the community. It used to be a month ago at 2%, now at 10%. The hospitalizations throughout all our hospitals, Mount Sinai, but all the other hospitals, are about three times as many as they were a month ago. And now with, again, resurgence of people in our ICUs and very sadly people dying. And the key points seem to be, yes, it may be variants. It may be one problem that are very, very contagious. But two, it has to do with vaccine. It has to do with the number of people vaccinated, maximal prevention, you know, vaccines we know work. And if people are not vaccinated, they don't have maximal prevention. And so with large gatherings without masks and international travel, 
those things are going to keep, those are things special to South Florida. And in South Florida, we are seeing, yes, a resurgence and increase at all of our hospitals with hospitalizations and death, sadly to say. So, Dr. Golder, even um, this morning, CDC's Rachel Walensky said that we are seeing this COVID 2.0 is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. However, we have seen and heard of people being uh, getting COVID who say they are fully vaccinated. And, and I'm gonna guess you're gonna say, well, those numbers are, are not very high. However, just on the Miami-Dade Commission, 13 people, two of them who say they're vaccinated have COVID. So that, that's really worrying to a lot of people. And, and I agree, and it shows that we need to be maintaining our public health measures. You know, people in New York now, they're talking about masking again with things go up. You know, my sense is people should be trying to stay a little bit separated. People should be, if you're in an indoor setting without without really knowing who you're with and large indoor settings, certainly people should have masks on still because whether it's variants, whether it's low immunity in certain patients that they have in certain people that haven't built up full immunity. There are some people with immunosuppressed diseases. There are many, many people with let's say transplants or cancer who are on immunosuppressive medication. So they don't mask, they don't mount a full immune reaction. Those people are still prone to COVID infection and some hospitalization as we know, seeing from right. people in the commission. Yeah. And um, we do know though, throughout the world that vaccines work, you know, vaccines really protect people against dying and in most parts hospitalization. So. They do work in a very, very high degree. No immunization is perfect, but um, we have had seen some great effects from those communities that have a lot of vaccine given, do have less hospitalizations, less deaths, and less infections. Can I just follow, follow up really quickly? You, firsthand, the people who are now hospitalized at Mount Sinai Medical Center for COVID characterize those people? Are they young, old, vaccinated, not vaccinated? What are you seeing on the ground? Yeah, good question. We're seeing 95 to 99% non-vaccinated patients. Wow. So mm -hmm. almost universally, it's non-vaccinated patients, number one. Number two is we're seeing younger patients, 30 to 70, 30 to 65 is the largest number of admissions. The elderly population in South Florida have had a lot of vaccine. And we think that's part of the reason Look, for instance, we have no admissions from nursing home this recently. And the nursing home population has been very well vaccinated. Some of the staff, not so much, but many of the patients. And so the patients we're seeing coming in the hospital are different than a year ago. Hmm. Yeah, They are the 30 to 60 year old non-vaccinated. Yeah, you know, doctor, I just checked the State Department of Health statistics this morning and I see that Floridians age 60 and above, roughly 80% of them have been vaccinated, but ages 20 to 29, it's just 38%. So we, we need to, I need to get your professional opinion on why are people so reluctant to get vaccinated? Well, that's a very good question. I think there are varied reasons. Um, I can tell you that as doctors, uh, most nurses, respiratory therapy, fire, police, we're very sad that there's so much vaccine hesitancy. It's a bad thing. We really wish more people would get vaccinated and make it safer for everybody else. So there are many, many reasons for it. Some of it's historical, some of it's cultural, some of it's your grandmother told you not to get vaccinated. Some of it is concern, oh, the vaccine, it's too quickly, it wasn't tested enough. Well, throughout the world, you know, there's been hundreds of millions of vaccine given. And so we know it's relatively safe. No, no vaccine, no medication is completely safe. You know, there's people that take aspirin and get reactions. There's people that take ibuprofen. There's people that take penicillin. They're allergic and they get problems. So no medication or vaccine is going to be perfect. And so, yes, there are going to be some, you know, side effects and some people not build up full immunity. But you can look around the country at these maps that show communities that have 80, 90 percent vaccination rate, their hospitalizations are still low. Right. Okay, so Ours we, in South Florida are no longer low. They are bouncing back up. We're quite concerned this is from 4th of July. 
We're going to see another spike, we think, you know, coming up after a lot of other gatherings that are going on now. So, so can we, we, we you know, um, anytime there's gatherings like this. Doctor, we're, I hate to interrupt you. We're just up against a break. We do have one or two more questions. Can you sit tight with us for just a couple of minutes? And sure. we will be right Definitely. back. Stay tuned. Thank you. We are back with Dr. Robert Golzer, the Chief Medical Officer at Mount Sinai Medical Center on Miami Beach. We're talking about COVID crisis 2.0. Dr. Golzer, I want to pick up on something you said really interesting, all the reasons that you are thinking people are still hesitant to get the vaccine. Um, I think one of them that we in the information business see is this misinformation, disinformation, some of it, frankly, politically charged. Mm -hmm. um, how at this point, how do you get past that? How do you tell people what they, to this point, aren't believing? Well, again, a very good question, very real question. Um, I believe this relates to the people that are spreading this information, having misinformation and spreading it. Um, anybody that's been in a hospital in the last year and a half, anybody that's had a family member who's passed away or been sick or now has chronic illness that we're seeing from related to COVID-19 infection should know and should spread the word how damaging this disease can be, how lethal this disease can be. You know, it points out to me um, the polio and measles vaccines and viruses, both very damaging virus, polio, a lethal virus. When polio vaccine came out in 1954, there was no internet People who read the newspaper, people called each other on the phone, people wrote each other letters, and everybody lined up and got vaccine, and then there was no more polio until people stopped taking vaccine. And the same thing with measles. People, everybody got measles, kids all got their shots, everybody got shots, and there was no measles. And now all of a sudden, as people hear about and think about and stop taking back vaccines at work and are safe, we have measles back. So. A lot of this has to do with our ability to use information. You know, that's freedom in America. We want to be able to speak and talk, but it has to be reliable information. So family members, uh, doctors, nurses, uh, healthcare workers, um, I think religious leaders play a big role. Community leaders play a big role of demonstrating vaccine and getting it out there to people, one, and letting it know it's safe has to be all we can do to counteract the skepticism that is there um, in many, many of our communities. Yeah. And very sadly, I'll add that this vaccine hesitancy and the vaccine resistance is only one thing that is exaggerating the healthcare disparities that we've seen from COVID-19. Mm -hmm. We know, and you've heard about the increase in infection in the Latin community, the Haitian community, African-American community, increased incidence, increased morbidity, increased mortality. And in many of those communities is where we see a lot of vaccine hesitancy. And that's something we all, in every way we can, need to counteract and try to work with. As doctors, we talk to all our patients, certainly, but everybody that is in the hospital really trying to push vaccine. Um, there are hospitals around the country and, and industries around the country that are going to mandate everybody gets COVID vaccine as a healthcare saving thing for your patients. For your families and that's something that is in development and obviously in evolution we have not done that yet but it's something that many many hospitals around the country are right. discussing dr robert goldser we are really happy to speak with you glad to have your expertise and we hope that people who may be hesitant heard your message and will get a shot Grateful. thanks very Thank much you. Well, the heartbreaking recoveries at the site of the Surfside collapse are starting to come to an end. The investigation into why that building fell, they're just beginning. The engineer tasked with doing just that for the city of Surfside is here next. The grim task of recovering human remains at the Champlain Tower South is now winding down. But the complex job of discovering what caused that collapse, collapse is gearing up. Surfside has hired its own structural engineer to determine the causes. Alan Kilsheimer actually has been examining Champlain North Tower this week, its materials, its construction, but has not been able to get on site at the South Tower collapse 
as that remains designated a crime scene. Alan Kilsheimer joins us live from Surfside. Great to have you with us, Alan. Thank you. Alan, good afternoon. Great to see you. Well, I yes, guess the yeah. obvious question is, at what point or how soon will you be able to get on site there at the Champlain Tower South? Uh, we're certainly ready to get on Champlain South as well as in the storage areas where they have taken off-site materials, essentially at a moment's notice. Uh, when we get access is not in my control. Um, th there are a number of different entities involved. I believe currently it's the Miami-Dade Police Department uh, is controlling the site as a crime scene. And we don't know when they're going to allow me in either of the two or three locations. So on site, on this crime scene, is the detectives, the homicide detectives from Miami-Dade Police doing their investigation. Also the federal investigators from NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, who are essentially doing on a federal level what you plan to do on, for the city level. Is there a way to take what they have so far, their sampling, their debris, their records, mm -hmm. their findings, and, and get a start? Well, we, we, we have a start. We've been working since the Friday after the collapse and doing our engineering analysis of the existing drawings and the, the information we have about the building. Uh, we've been working with Champlain North to get a better understanding of if it was built very similarly, of the very things that are in it and the way it was put together. Uh, we don't know what NIST is doing. Uh, I've seen a video that show certain things, but I don't see them doing any of the thing. Uh, I don't see them doing the things that we need to do. Like what? What are those things? Well, we need to take samples of the various concrete and reinforcing steel and conduit and other materials that were in the building that collapsed to understand what they're made of, to understand their strength, uh, to understand what might be in it as far as other materials that maybe weren't supposed to be in there if there were such a thing. Uh, the most important thing in my mind, however, is having access to the site so we can begin our investigation of the ground below the basement, the foundation systems, and the condition of the foundation systems in the ground. Yeah. Alan, uh, you and your team, as you said, have been at that north building. It was built in, what, 1982, a year after the south building essentially the same architectural, structural plans. I know you have taken concrete samples, other things. What is your conclusion about the structural integrity of the North Building? There's nothing that we've seen in the North Building from either our visual inspections, uh, our LIDAR uh, observations, uh, our surveying information, and the sampling, the limited sampling of materials and columns and slabs that tells us that there's anything that uh, is negative in the building. In fact, so far, everything has been uh, proven out to be in excess of what was called for on the drawings, but we have not tested any reinforcing steel or sampled it because we don't want to be cutting reinforcing steel and we can't do the in-ground investigations at Champlain North because at high tide, it would flood the basement and we don't want to do that. So let, let's go back to South for a moment. Before you get on site there, before you have tangible items that you're talking about. You've got 40 years of records of this building. We've talked a lot about the records. You've got anecdotal evidence. You've got witness reports. Now you have 911 uh, calls. So you have puzzle pieces of an investigation. And they all seem to sort of corroborate that there was an issue in that slab under the concrete slab under the pool deck of Champlain South. Uh, and, and the 2018 engineering report that was done for that building in advance of its 40-year recertification says the same thing. And, and I, I think we have a graphic that, of a quote out of that report that I know you've read, um, essentially saying that the, the pool deck is in need of immediate attention or it will get exponentially worse. So taking all of this evidence that you have so far is there any way to begin to say, as a structural engineer, boy, this looks like the linchpin? No, it's not. Um, we, you know, we've, we have all the data, and you left out one item, which is a 2020 report of work that actually was done at the site uh, in doing concrete repair work. Uh, 
Uh, so there was some level of work that was done in 2020. And then we have the drawings that were done um, as a preview of the work that was going to be done for the 40-year uh, uh, recertification. And we see what they say. Um, th there's no way there's no way to know. We, we don't know from the, all the information I reviewed, and there's probably more than several thousand of that information coming in on the internet and coming in via phone calls and people send us things and stuff like that. We, we, we don't know what the first thing was that fell. Uh, we have to be able to prove that factually. We have lots of information, but we need to understand what was the trigger it, you called it the linchpin. Yeah. We need to be able to investigate the ground conditions, the foundation conditions, the foundation materials used, and all of that. And what, once we can do that, and once we have the strength of the various materials used in that building based on the sampling and testing that we want to do, then we can start putting them kind of in order of what may have happened. And we're going to, you know, I have 20 or 30 different things that could have happened in my mind. Uh, we have eliminated a couple of them. We have lowered a few of them down on the totem pole. We've added some more. Um, the 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 idea is to take and take all these different material strengths and foundation situations that we have and do the engineering analysis with that factual information. And we might find that the trigger was X, but if this material was a little bit stronger than it was, maybe X wouldn't have been as bad or some combination like that. So yeah. factually, we don't have any factual information at all of how that building was built and the materials that were used to support or build that building. Yeah, but Alan, do you not have the uh, the rubble? I mean, billions of tons of, of concrete and steel have been removed and tracked out to a site. I don't know if that's accessible to you but I mean, you and your team could look at the rebar that's in that rubble. You can certainly examine that concrete. Uh, have you been able to do that? We've not allowed to been able to do any of that. What we've been allowed to do so far is on a half a dozen or a dozen locations uh, times, I have walked around the perimeter of the site up close where the guys are working, but not on the pile, have been able to see uh, what I could see, I've not been allowed to take any pictures of it, but I do have in my mind what I saw. But seeing it doesn't tell you what the materials are. Concrete has eight zillion kinds of comp different composition possibilities. Reinforcing steel has a half a dozen or so of them. You, the foundations, we haven't seen the foundations because we haven't seen even the, the basement slab. Yeah. So we so, are going to as we've been doing all week, keep hounding you. And <laughs> when you are able to do so, we will have you back and we'd like to hear every detail of what you've learned. Sure. We appreciate your time today. Thank Thanks you very so much. much Alan. Thank you. And we'll be right back. As always, we thank you for being with us and invite you to get in touch anytime. We are always online 24 seven at local10.com. And remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. Have a great Sunday.